Welcome to Cranbrook Art Museum. I'm Andrew Blavelt, the director. Um, hopefully, there's still some seats available in the, in the rake, and then up here along the balcony, and there is a cash bar, and you can drink. So, <laughs> so it should be the best lectures ever. Um, <laughs> Uh, let's see. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome, or rather welcome back to Cranbrook, Daniel Arsham and Alex Mestison of Snarkitecture. Um, Daniel, is a, Daniel Arsham is a New York-based uh, artist who works across the fields of art, architecture, film, and performance. Raised in Miami, Arsham attended the Cooper Union in New York City, where he received the Gelman Trust Fellowship Award in 2003. Structural experiments, historical inquiry, and satirical wit all combined in Arsham's ongoing interrogation of the real and the imagined, which is on full display in our galleries right outside these doors, which will open um, preceding uh, after this lecture, um, in an exhibition called The Source, a catalog of late 20th century American relics. Um, Daniel's work has been presented extensively, including at the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, MoMA PS1 New York, and the New Museum New York, among others and his work is represented in the collections of the Perez Art Museum in Miami, the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, and the Centre Pompidou in Paris. Daniel will be speaking about his work in particular and will be joined tonight by another guest, which is Alex, who is also a partner in Snarkitecture, and Alex will talk more about the Snarkitecture portfolio. Alex uh, studied at the um, Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture at the Cooper Union in New York. Um, blending their backgrounds in art and architecture. The duo co-founded Snarkitecture in 2007, a collaborative practice with a conceptual approach centered on the importance of experience. The studio's reinterpretation of everyday structures and materials invite people to engage and explore with their surroundings to new and imaginative effect. Their acclaimed installations have been shown at the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C., Design Miami at Art Basel, Miami Beach, exhibit Columbus in Columbus, Indiana, and at Navy Pier in Chicago, among others. Snarkitecture's work in transforming retail environments includes their showrooms for apparel brand Kith in New York, Los Angeles, Miami, and Brooklyn. Today, we are pleased to debut The Source, Daniel's latest installation on view, or, on view in our galleries in the lower level, as well as the installation of Falling Clock in the museum's main stairwell, which we notice most people miss because you're trying not to fall down the steps. So <laughs> when you go back up, you can reverse, turn around and look at it. Um, I would like to thank our curatorial team here at the Cranbrook Art Museum, including John Geiger, Corey Gross, and Laura Mott and their teams for realizing this um, particular installation and exhibition. And I'm very pleased to thank, along with Library Street Collective, we are pleased to announce the opening of the Beach Detroit, which actually opened to the public today, a public art installation at 1001 Woodward Avenue, which is at Campus Martius, which features more than a million plastic balls that create an ocean-like environment for visitors to explore and with which to engage. And you have until April 14th to check out that particular installation. The Beach Detroit is brought to you by Bedrock and Quicken Loans Community Fund, and you can learn more about how to go to the beach and reserve your spot by visiting thebeachdetroit.com for more details about how to do that. And I'd like to personally thank uh, JJ and Anthony Curris for um, their collaboration around these projects and for bringing uh, Daniel Arsham and Snarkitecture to Detroit. Without further ado, please help me welcome Daniel Arsham. So happy to be uh, back in Detroit. Thank you guys all so much for being here. So this talk is normally a, a kind of hour, hour plus long talk. And being that Alex is here, I'm going to try to run through it a little bit quicker. So I may be going through images as I'm speaking uh, over them so that Alex has a chance to talk about the work that we do uh, with architecture. Um, being that were at Cranbrook University, I included some works um, that were made while I was in school. Um, and I, even though much of my work now resides in uh, fields of design and sculpture, I actually studied painting primarily uh, when I was at Cooper Union in New York. Um, much of the earlier work centers around this kind of combination between the natural landscape and these kind of architectural interventions within them. 
in many cases, the architecture begins to replicate formally uh, some of the structures within the kind of natural landscapes. Um, and as the work developed, uh, I began to pull out pieces of the architecture, columns and staircases. Um, the technique that was used for all of these works was a, a gouache uh, on mylar um, painting, which was a kind of um, technique that I learned actually by taking a course at Cooper within the architecture school. So a kind of early form of architectural rendering. I grew up in Miami um, and a lot of these works were kind of inspired by and painted within this sort of natural uh, swamp landscape out in the Everglades. And the architectural structures that were in them were often things that didn't contain a specific purpose. You know, I wanted them to convey a human hand or the idea of a human maker, but something that remained ambiguous. So we couldn't say this had a particular function, um, but it definitely appears in contrast to the natural element. Um, and one other thing that I'll come back to is this idea of things that are in between a state of construction and destruction. We could say that these columns are rising or falling, um, but their position within that is somewhat ambiguous. Um, other kinds of intervention within uh, historical artwork, paintings of these Greek and Roman um, statues with these sort of interventions within them. Um, and continued with painting, this is probably now 2009, um, interventions within uh, more historical um, space travel. Almost like these land art, Michael Heiser-esque um, gestures. Um, science fiction and uh, film has played a big part um, in my work, sort of unconsciously during this period, um, and more specifically, as I'll get to later. The first works that I made that were um, sculptural in this way were the kind of inverse thinking. So in the drawings, you had a natural landscape with a kind of architectural environment or intervention within them. And we can imagine these as the reverse case scenario where there's an architectural environment with a natural um, sort of erosion or decay. Um, and these contain still this idea between construction uh, or, or construction. So the columns are either falling apart or like a stalactite and a stalagmite growing um, to a kind of completion kind of erosion in the surface of the architecture, um, similar to some of the natural uh, glacial-like forms that I was painting early on. And thinking about other ways that I can manipulate the surface of architecture, um, borrowing other methods of um, kind of decay, transformation, and really, you know, making one material look like another. So. In SN architecture, we have a kind of idea about causing architecture to perform in unexpe unexpected ways, um, allowing it to do things that it shouldn't otherwise be doing. Um, and in a lot of the work that I'm doing, I'm trying to create the sense that I'm not actually adding anything. It's a manipulation of something that you already know that you have a kind of expectation about. This was an installation at um, Savannah College of Art uh, Museum which was this 300 foot long series of excavations that um, looking down this hallway, you saw a figure towards the end of it, um, beginning with a cube at the opposite side. Uh, however, when you arrive at the end, the figure is um, five times your size. Just a little scale, scale reference. This was a space that was quite um, challenging to figure out how to place other works within it. Um, so within these uh, excavated walls, there were these kind of miniature uh, galleries that contained other sort of architectural interventions. Um, in much of the early work, figures don't, um, don't come up, right? I had left out people in many of them um, because I always felt that based on their dress, the way that they carried themselves, even their haircut, 
you identify the works with a particular moment in time. And I always wanted the works to kind of float in time. So even the earlier drawings, you could say that they could be now, they could be in the past, they could be uh, in the future. Um, continuing to iterate on ways of manipulating the surface of architecture, uh, integrating some figures into the work. Um, but the figures are often in a state of um, concealment, hiding, they're interacting with the architecture in ways that can be um, uncanny, disturbing, especially for children sometimes. <laughs> um, but often things that, I mean, I don't know how many people saw the clock that's upstairs, as Andrew mentioned, they kind of dissipate into the architecture and they're often things that you might not notice on, on uh, first glance. Um, but once you do notice them, there's this kind of very sort of visceral, uncanny quality to them. Um, as the work has progressed, I've often been presented with scenarios where I can increase the scale of them. This was a large installation in Russia uh, last year. A version of the clock that's uh, very similar to the one upstairs. This was an interesting scenario where I was able to actually affect both sides of the architecture. So on the exterior of this building, you see a figure protruding from the surface. And on the, when you walk around to the inside of the building, you see the negative impression of the figure. Some of these works existed, uh, in this case, this is the same exhibition in, um, in Moscow, but um, existed as an idea for many years in drawings um, before the, not only the, the technical capability of myself and the team in the studio, um, but the opportunity with the space to present it. Um, architectural materials, right, the, the idea that these works are manipulating something that's pre-existing, right? They're made of um, the same materials that the drywall and that the walls are constructed from. Um, and the attention to materials is something that's present uh, even with the installation uh, and the exhibition here. These works are constructed from uh, shattered glass that is um, coming from uh, destroyed buildings. So the idea being these are kind of repurposing something and reforming it to an object with the kind of intention uh, behind it. So I had a very uh, fortunate kind of life altering experience. Um, around 2004, I was introduced to Merce Cunningham, the gentleman on my right, um, and Robert Rauschenberg on my left. And Merce was sort of nearing the end of his career in stage design and in, in, in dance. And he asked me to create um, a stage, uh, a, f a full stage design for him, including the lighting and the costumes. And the way that Merce worked uh, as, a, as a choreographer was to separate the different elements uh, of an evening. So he would say, I'm gonna make the choreography, an artist will make the scenography, and a musician will make the score, but none of us will know what the other one is doing, which, sometimes was amazing and sometimes was really terrible. <laughs> um, uh, he liked to say that this allowed him to find things that he might not have otherwise made the decision to do based on his own uh, taste, based on his, his own choice, um, and that he wouldn't you know, necessarily put his own opinion on it. In the end, the works that he thought were good went into repertory and continued to tour. The other ones disappeared into history. Um, after Merce died, I began to, um, this was the final performance of the company, uh, at the Park Avenue Armory, which contained these kind of cloud-like uh, sculptures based on uh, images that I had taken while touring with Merce's company uh, around the world.
following Mercer's death, I began to work with a younger uh, choreographer who had been part of his company uh, as a dancer. And one of the things with, uh, or in working with Merce was, I could never create things that the dancers would physically interact with because he wouldn't know what I was making. Um, and with Jonah, I sort of approached it in the inverse way where the elements of the stage were very much part of uh, the choreography. They were often um, these objects that kind of motiv motivated movement. film that we made um, trying to expand some of the ideas on stage into a kind of film form. taken other opportunities to bring um, Jonah and his company into the gallery setting and allow them to perform within that. In 2010, I made a, a great um, trip in Easter Island, which is a South Pacific island famous for these Moai statues. And uh, being a student of history and archaeology, sort of having a, an experience there that was different from many other archaeological sites that I had visited in that the story which is told about um, this place, about how these statues were constructed, is still not agreed upon between different schools of thought um, from archaeologists. And it led me to the idea that obviously archaeology is a kind of story. There's no way to know what actually happened and could I um, reverse engineer that idea of archaeology and project it into the future. So could I take objects from our present and cause them to appear as if they have been uncovered um, thousands of years from now? And I began with technological objects, things that I felt um, were married to a specific moment. And thinking about material as an additional way of um, kind of storytelling within the work engaging uh, crystal, volcanic ash, these kind of geological materials that we would immediately associate with a, a kind of geological time frame. Um, and picking uh, objects that I felt not only were relevant uh, to me personally, but had this kind of global, um, global significance. So if I'm showing these works here in Detroit or in Tokyo or in China, they, they still have this the, a similar kind of um, origin story to them or feeling. Certainly, a, you know, a global global touch point object. So in the beginning, when I returned from that trip. I tried to do some tests and, you know, I studied some sculpture in school, plaster casting, etc. cetera, um, but there's no sort of <laughs> manual or guide for casting crushed crystal or volcanic ash. So it took a number of years before the objects wouldn't be falling apart um, continually. I obviously want them to appear as if they're in a state of decay, but not continue to do so. Um, and this was an, opera, an exhibition that I had in Miami where I was actually able to kind of think about the archaeological site um, in itself. And in some ways, the exhibition that's here at Cranbrook is an extension of that um, beyond the archaeological site, imagining a kind of future um, museum that would be exhibiting these works as past uh, archaeological finds. In this case, the, the floor was excavated and the objects pr um, kind of continued to proceed underneath the surface mm -hmm. as if they continued sort of forever. This was the first uh, piece that I made that was in a material that um, was soft, right? So added a whole new um, era of work 
within my own practice that uh, were castings of the of fabric and stitching. Uh, and in many cases, I've sort of selected a um, for an exhibition a body of of work that centered around sports or music or something that I could kind of identify. Techniques, 1200 turntable. Um, and in thinking about continuing much of the work that was integrating figures into the work, this was the first piece that I made um, where the figure was cast in this material. And I had based it on a, a very famous um, statue, the Dying Gaul, um, sort of referencing this kind of positioning within the work. And in some of the other pieces, I've done that as well. Um, but it wasn't necessarily talked about uh, in the presentation of the original piece. So one of the things that you'll notice from basically this slide going back is the lack of color within the work. Um, and partially that has to do with uh, some of the early materials that I was drawn to, but I also happened to be colorblind. So this, the initial selection of, um, of color in my work was entirely based around things that I knew what I was looking at would be what everyone else was looking at. And um, this was an exhibition in 2015, um, after being introduced to uh, a kind of revolutionary company called Enchroma, which developed lenses that um, partially correct uh, the color vision and replace um, my ability to see a, a wider spectrum of color. Um, so I started experimenting with colored crystal. In this case, this was blue calcite, uh, integrating a, a kind of wider range of palette within the work and revisiting some of the, the earlier pieces, a full room uh, amethyst uh, crystal basketballs and soccer. And based on the, um, the kind of beauty and the very visceral quality that I found in some of the cast works uh, that were made in fabric, um, casting some of these kind of soft, uh, almost childlike toys. Japan has had a big influence um, first visited um, Japan about 10 years ago with my wife, who's uh, Japanese, and thinking about the, the sort of um, care that that culture gives to objects um, and uh, to design in general. Um, this was an exhibition at the, the High Museum in Atlanta um, where I recreated a, a garden that I had seen in Kyoto um, ent entirely, but shifting the material and the color um, to this blue calcite uh, crystal. The kind of evolution of time within the work, going back even to the first um, paintings where the works kind of float in time. Uh, this was an, a work housed within an hourglass in which two objects at opposing ends um, kind of play out this cyclical archaeology. So as one uh, or as the hourglass is turned, one object is buried, the other one is in a process of uncovery, and that cycle continues uh, over and over again. Another iteration of the, the garden in a, uh, a kind of gradient of quartz to uh, pink, pink quartz sand and an, an exterior version of it, which I was fortunate to do um, in Rio, very much situated within the landscape.
because so much of my work now involves um, travel, I've found ways to integrate some of the experiences um, from different places, both into the work that I do within my own studio um, and with Snarkitecture. So I'm gonna invite Alex up here in a minute. Um, but actually, there's a couple more things in here. Um, Snarkitecture was originally founded, um, Alex and I studied uh, in school together, and I didn't study architecture, but a lot of my work that engaged architecture required a kind of architectural knowledge um, to complete. And Alex helped me on some early projects, figuring out you know, how I could not only make these works permanent, but some of the exterior pieces that required engineering and structural you know, capabilities. Um, and so following that, we started Snarkitecture as a way to kind of expand that. And now it has grown into its own practice and has its own aesthetic and its own kind of um, life behind it. So I'm gonna have Alex um, come up and give a um, presentation around that sort of universe. And then we'll hold the, the questions for both until the end. Is this on here? Hey everyone, um, I'm Alex from Sun Architecture. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Um, do I need to do anything to put this on? Um, so, as Daniel mentioned, we started Sun Architecture in um, 2008 following having been at uh, Cooper Union in New York, but um, this image is one that we'll come back to, but sort of a founding uh, document for the practice in some ways. Um, so this is where uh, it kind of all began and that we both went to school here. Daniel studied art, I studied architecture. Um, and the, stu the studios in the school are just one floor apart and they share a shop, which was sort of a central part of um, architectural education. And I think Daniel's education as uh, an artist as well. Um, in that uh, it's the really one of the few spaces actually that art and architecture overlap um, at Cooper is in this uh, wood shop. And um, there was also something I think about the idea of making that was really central to um, the programs at Cooper that we, uh, I think, took to heart in thinking about what we wanted to do when we started Snark Architecture. Um, in some ways, this is really where the name comes from. This is the cover of a poem by Lewis Carroll called The Hunting of the Snark. Um, it was published in 1876, and um, it describes um, the impossible journey of an improbable crew to find an inconceivable creature. So it's basically this crew of misfits that's sailing around the world um, looking for this unknown creature called the snark. And uh, this is their map. So they have a blank uh, sheet of paper as their ocean chart. Uh, and this is something uh, I think we sort of think about and refer to um, as a kind of an analog for the practice. Um, I think the other thing, in addition to this idea about making things, creating a physical uh, experience, creating physical space, um, when we started was the idea of the studio. Um, even though the studio, the practice, um, are architecturally influenced, we don't think of them as a firm or an office. Um, the studio for us is a place of experimentation, it's a place um, of making, and um, it really draws in some ways uh, more from Daniel's background as an artist than uh, mine as an architect. But um, this was the first studio we got. It was in Greenpoint in Brooklyn. Um, it was just a big open space that was sort of uh, at all times some version of controlled chaos. Um, and then a couple years ago we moved the studio um, to this space which is in Long Island City. Um, so this is what it looks like now. Um, and it's a space again of collaboration, of um, experimentation. Um, the work, a lot of the work is in the studio whether it's uh, past prototypes or uh, upcoming uh, sort of t tests or mock-ups. Um, and then here's the three of us. So uh, th there's me and Daniel, and then the guy on the left is uh, our third partner, Benjamin Porto. So um, Ben and I were out here a few years ago and did a, gr a residency or a workshop, rather, um, with the 3D class here, which was really great. So it's nice to be back. Um, but Ben joined us um, in 2014 as uh, we'll talk a little bit about the work um, that the practice is doing. But as we're growing in scale um, and working on more architecturally inclined projects, um, we brought Ben on, um, who had more of a traditional sort of architectural background than I did. Um, and he uh, continues to sort of lead some of those projects in the studio. Um, 
So what I want to do with this talk, it'll, I'll try to keep it short. We can uh, leave some time for questions and discussion at the end. Um, but is uh, just to review some sort of key, more significant projects for the studio from the last 10 years, um, hopefully with an aim towards sort of uh, describing the origin of the studio, um, but also getting at some of the overall goals um, that we're trying to achieve with the practice. Um, so this talk is loosely organized in actually the same format um, that our book is. We made this book last year, and, and thinking about how to look back at the work and categorize it, we, um, uh, rather than sort of compartmentalize the projects into different themes or different categories or different typologies, uh, the, the work is arrayed on the spectrum, and the spectrum is called not art to not architecture, which is really um, the sort of simple way of thinking about what we're doing is that we think of it as being between these disciplines and experimenting in the space around the edges of them or the peripheries, um, but in some ways it's really neither. Um, so the first work in this project or in this uh, deck here is called The Memorial Bowing and it's a public artwork in Miami uh, that was commissioned for the new baseball stadium they built there in 2012. Um, when we started working on this, Daniel being from Miami, um, had particularly strong connection uh, to the city and to the stadium which existed on the site before called the Miami Orange Bowl. Um, so when we created uh, the concept for the work, we knew we wanted to, to reference or uh, contain some fragment of the old stadium. Um, and so we were looking at the sign, the Miami Orange Bowl sign. There's the uh, old stadium being torn down, there's the new one being built, um, and this is where the project is on this plaza on the east side of the stadium. Um, so what the project is are these letters from the sign. They're reconstructed at their original scale in their original color. Um, but rather than spelling out Miami Orange Bowl or rather being upright, um, they're all in these sort of different conditions of sinking or falling or turning or uh, rotating. And um, here's a study of some of the letters. Um, and then this is them being built. So they're made from reinforced cast concrete. Um, each letter, uh, there's 15 letters, and uh, they're positioned in ways that suggest sort of different programs or different activities. People can engage with the letters in um, these kind of unexpected ways. Um, this is a very interesting project to sort of get approved um, through the building department, and um, I'm sort of still sort of surprised every time I go there that they let us build it. Um, it does get skated quite a bit, um, but I think it also gets used, um, and people seem to enjoy it. Um, so you're sort of creating these new meanings. So they're spelling new, new words from old, seeing the new stadium through the uh, fragments of the old. Um, we work at quite a different range of scale. Um, so we're doing everything from these kind of large scale, whether it's a uh, public installation or uh, sort of an architectural environment, um, down to the scale of a small object. So Pillow is a, one of these objects that kind of just came out of internal, um, I mean, I wouldn't even really call it research. It's more like, um, sort of loose experimentation, uh, material research in the studio, um, and playing with this um, uh, things that appear one way but are in fact another. In this case, Daniel talked a little bit about some of the contrast between soft and hard in the uh, materiality of his sculptures. And this is um, a functional object, but it has a single function. Um, in this case, it's to hold a phone. Um, and that's kind of all it does. But it's made from uh, cast gypsum. And so it's uh, something that's hard, it's rigid, um, it has a weight to it. Um, and what we did after we did the phone was starting to do these kind of almost workshop um, pop-up versions where we would create a satellite studio. And the first one we did was at the new museum and invited people to bring whatever they wanted um, uh, to us and we would make a pillow for it. So people for the weekend would line up and like bring all these random um, pieces that we would then cast these custom uh, sort of one of a kind pillows for. So it's an object that, um, uh, suggests it has a kind of a latent quality where the object is there even when it's not there. Um, and yeah, uh, sort of playing with the idea of function, something that's functional but has a very specific range of function. Um, Loop is a project that uh, we did last year in uh, Seoul in Korea and it was uh, commissioned by Koss, which is a, um, a fashion brand. So we do a lot of work that um, sort of exists somewhere in the range between a sort of a more cu cultural, um, institutional sort of range and a more commercial kind of range. And then there's projects like this that are sort of commissioned or supported by a commercial brand but exist in a cultural space. And so this was in an art gallery um, in Seoul and uh, it was really um, sort of emerged on, after a long fascination 
that we had was this idea of a marble run, um, a kind of children's toy uh, that you put a marble in and it goes down. And so we have this huge space. Um, so we created these two scenarios. You basically come up the stairs to the second floor and you walk into this gallery, um, which I'll show you a photo of, but it's basically filled with marbles that are spilling out of the wall. And then you walk through this hallway and you come into this room that's filled with this extremely large sort of architectural scaled custom marble run. Um, this is it being installed. And so this is the first room. So there's this track over here um, where the marbles are kind of emerging and then they run over here and sort of pour down. Um, and they're literally just kind of uh, spilling out and you can walk in there and uh, grab them. And then uh, you come in this next room and this is a fully automated marble run. It's 400 meters of track that has uh, 100,000 marbles rolling through it. Um, so you can stop them, you can put new ones in um, and then they just kind of disappear in the floor. Um, so Daniel mentioned the idea of making architecture perform the unexpected, which was uh, kind of a central tenant uh, when we started talking about what this collaboration would be. Um, and uh, another thing that's sort of emerged for us is this idea about making architecture accessible and engaging, um, creating scenarios and moments and environments that invite a really wide array of people to um, engage with um, the structure, engage with the space, engage with the uh, material in a very sort of direct and tactile way. Um, and one of the ways that we do that, um, for instance, in this project is uh, creating spaces of play. So this can be something that's contemplative, it might be meditative, but it's also playful. Um, and um, some of the projects, um, more than others, create this uh, kind of connection to something that we might ref think of or uh, recall an idea of childhood or something that we uh, understood to be a toy or something that we um, would engage with in this kind of uh, uninhibited way. Um, this is a piece called Split. Um, it's made from marble, uh, culture, uh, cast marble rather. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a piece that's sort of, it's functional, but sort of, um, of indeterminate function. It's the height of a seat or a side table. Um, and it appears as if it's either moving apart or coming together, um, but the two pieces do nest together perfectly. Um, the beach, um, as Andrew mentioned, the beach has recently opened today um, in downtown Detroit, so I'd encourage you all to go see it and um, try it. Uh, it's free, uh, and so yeah, thank you to Library Street Collective and Bedrock for making that project happen here. Um, it's a project that we've uh, staged several times internationally. So the first version of it um, was in 2015 at the National Building Museum, where it was commissioned there as part of a summer installation series. Um, the project is quite simple. Um, it's an enclosure, um, the floor is sloped, and then it's filled in. Uh, and the idea of this project is obviously to reference this totally universal experience of beach going, going to the beach, um, and transforming it, uh, reimagining it, bringing it into a new environment, changing the materials, changing the color, um, and therefore creating this sort of different version of uh, going to the beach. So. It's changed kind of each time. These are just um, sort of typical plans and sections of how it works, but this is the National Building Museum space. This was when it was in um, uh, Arena in Tampa. Um, and here's the balls going in. So um, it's basically a sort of a mystery from outside. You can hear it. Um, you might have some sense, but then you let up this ramp um, and you enter into a space that uh, unfolds in front of you. And this is really kind of gets at what's going on in the project, which is the kind of the material shift. Um, instead of sand, we have this kind of textured carpet material. And instead of water, we have these uh, antimicrobial plastic balls. So um, you're in a sea of a million of these um, balls, which we're thinking of not as an object, but as an architectural material, taking something that we might know or think of as an object and multiplying it to a point where it becomes almost unrecognizable. It becomes something new. Um, and this is another project that for us is really about uh, creating these spaces of uh, accessibility. So inviting people who uh, might not have an interest in art or design or architecture um, to come to a space and uh, hopefully have a meaningful and memorable experience that opens the door to that conversation, allows them to sort of see um, how these disciplines um, might be important to our everyday lives and how they might allow us to reimagine um, different aspects of our lives. Um, so yeah, there's a, uh, you know, bring whatever you want when you go down there. Um, um, this is another object. This is a vase um, that we did as a, um, a sort of a two-part collaboration with a, a company from the UK called 1882. Um, so there's uh, basically a positive and a negative 
Um, this is the positive. It's a cylindrical vase that has this excavated volume kind of impressed into it. And then um, this is its counterpart, which is the negative, which is actually a cast of the mold that made the positive. And so this is the limited edition version and the other one's the um, production version. But um, they're both made from bone china and they're made in the same factories in Stoke-on-Trent where they were making ceramic for hundreds of years before a lot of that industry left um, the UK to go overseas. And so uh, this brand's been working with designers like us to um, sort of bring new approaches to a, sort of a traditional uh, craft. Um, different collaboration, different company. This is a mirror uh, with the Italian design company Gufram. Um, and so we're really excited to be able to work with them because they have a sort of a long lineage of working with, um, from the radical design movement in Italy in the 60s. Um, and uh, so we felt uh, really excited to be able to um, create something for them and uh, work with them in this kind of strange material that they're known for, which is a polyurethane foam that has this coating on it that's very durable. Um, so we proposed this mirror. So it would be a mirror that was um, uh, a glass mirror and functional, but that the frame of it would be soft um, and that it would be something that would appear to be maybe broken. Um, and also this idea about creating um, a kind of a threshold or a portal. Um, so it has this kind of cutaway texture, but um, obviously this is the mirror itself. But when you um, touch the frame of it, it's um, soft. It has this kind of tactility that invites you to like press it and lean against it. Um, and sort of has this sort of uncanny effect. Um, Velextra, uh, this was an interior. Um, so we've done quite a bit of uh, work in retail, which really emerged from um, some early collaborations with uh, friends and colleagues that we knew in New York that were in fashion and through working in fashion, creating pop-ups, creating uh, presentations, runway shows, um, eventually started to work in actual sort of uh, brick and mortar retail. Um, and this was a commission for the uh, flagship of uh, Velextra, which is the luxury leather goods company based in Milan. Um, and our proposal here was this idea about a whiteout, um, but one that would use this um, architecturally uh, influenced material of this white mesh. So the white mesh and the scaffold are things that you see around Milan and some other European cities when they do a building renovation. It's like beautifully wrapped in this white mesh. Um, so we created the, in all of the surfaces of the store, the walls, the ceiling, are made from this material. Um, and the whole store is kind of a play on material and um, tactility. Um, so things that are hard, or th things that look hard or, hard or soft and things that look soft or hard, um, kind of inviting you to actually uh, engage with the surroundings, um, again, in a kind of a direct and tactile way. Um, so the ceiling has this kind of undulating form that, um, a lot of the work, um, seeing the sort of the form of the ceiling here or the kind of excavated irregular form, um, for instance, in Split, uh, we're thinking in these scenarios about um, this kind of balance or play between precision and looseness. Um, the precision of a rational architectural system versus this illogical, almost uh, dreamlike uh, form of this uh, sculpted or uh, excavated kind of uh, language. Um, pour is another furniture piece, um, in this case made from wood, um, a piece that looks as if it's either been broken or starting to break. Um, and then this infill volume here is uh, hand carved from calicotta marble in this kind of soft, um, almost like liquid-like form that's re recreating the um, program or function for the piece. Um, Kith, LA. So we've done a lot of work with Kith. They're a brand based in New York, um, footwear, apparel. Um, and uh, I think there's a couple of these projects in here, um, some of the more recent ones. So this one is in LA, um, and it's a sort of an interesting environment and in that's a subterranean store. It's in the bottom of the basement of a parking garage, essentially. So you pull up your car and you get out and you're basically at Kith. Um, and the store is in some ways designed around this um, the sneaker room, which is uh, this sort of isolated pavilion within the center of the space um, that presents the, uh, the shoes, the footwear, as this kind of jewel, uh, jewel box within the middle. Um, this is the space. Um, cash wrap, accessories. So yeah, this is the, um, the footwear space surrounded by these uh, uh, freestanding glass fins um, and then this uh, sort of uh, uh, infinite uh, light plane on the ceiling. Um, we'll come back, maybe we'll come back to these shoes, but this has been an important part of our collaboration with Kith is these cast um, sneakers that show up in every store. And so the very first store we did with uh, Ronnie and Kith, we wanted, um, we knew we wanted this um, sort of 
installation moment within the store, something that would um, invite you into the space and uh, in, invite you to stay there and to actually look and linger. Um, and so we talked about what that should be um, and ultimately ended up on this idea of the, um, the Jordan sneaker. So the first store we did the Jordan 1 and for each store we've done, we've done the next version of the Jordan. So I think we're up to the 8 or 9 now, um, but there's a better picture of it in one of the other projects. Um, this is a collaboration we did with a newer company called Pentatonic. Um, they're based out of Berlin, and they're creating furniture and uh, design objects out of 100% recycled material. Um, so everything you see in these pieces um, is made from a recycled um, PET, aluminum, um, uh, the felt, um, and what we've proposed to them um, was this idea about taking a, an existing kind of silhouette um, which was, you know, they had the space and then adding a new form on top of it, which was uh, this bench that would be cut. So um, it's, a, it's both a bench uh, and a chair, um, something that separates, goes together, um, suggests this kind of um, locking and unlocking. Um, and slab table, this was actually one of the first pieces we ever made um, at the scale of furniture, and it was something that we made for the studio. At the time, we uh, didn't have a table, uh, so we needed one. So we made this table that was uh, playing with this uh, idea of precision and looseness, this excavated form below that would be relatively concealed, um, but the top of the table itself is rectangular. Um, and obviously, in addition to being a conference table, is a ping pong table, um, which uh, we played a lot of ping pong. Um, Topographies is a collaboration with a brand called Calico, which is a wallpaper company based in Brooklyn, New York. And um, Calico came around a few years ago with this idea of uh, non-repeating wallpaper. So wallpaper by its nature tends to be repeating. Um, it's kind of how it works. But um, by using digital printing, um, they're able to create these relatively large um, uh, pieces that are non-repeating. And so what we proposed to them was this play on the actual idea of paper and this sort of layering. So using physical paper, uh, we created this sort of stacked um, uh, landscape of paper, if you will, that was then scanned um, and enlarged, and this is what it looks like. So this is actually just two-dimensional wallpaper, and it has this um, strangely effective trompe l'oeil effect of uh, suggesting this uh, unexpected depth within the architectural surface. Um, and yeah, this is um, just a couple different installations of it. Um, Kith Miami, so here's a better view of these um, Jordans. So for um, each store we do, they're being sort of arrayed in the space in a different way, a different configuration. Here in the Miami store, they happen to be in these arches that separate the different bays of the store. Um, but this is getting at a little bit of some of the ideas that Daniel was talking about in terms of um, uh, the material transformation of something from soft to hard, um, the uncanny um, feeling of seeing this thing in a uh, perfectly monochromatic object. Um, it looks like a sort of a model of the original. Um, Miami was an interesting version. Um, this was like the third or fourth store we did for Kith, I think, and um, it was in a historic space on the beach um, in, on Collins and uh, had this terrazzo floor that was kind of um, on one hand, uh, tricky to work with, but on the other hand, also kind of amazing and um, inspired some of the material palette for um, especially this space, which was all this custom terrazzo that moved from a, a dark blue to a white at the other end of the room. Um, what I would say about the Kith spaces that's important to us is this idea that um, obviously they're functional retail environments. Um, they perform quite well, but when we think of uh, as an architecture project, we're not thinking of what's happening here as somehow separate from the rest of the environment. It's something that's fully integrated. It's um, an extension um, and just part of our uh, design that we're proposing to them and creating for the space. Um, slip chair is um, a sort of a simple play on this idea of something that appears to be tilting or falling or unstable. Um, in this case, a wood uh, chair and on top of it is this rather heavy uh, granite volume that's uh, level, so it's restoring this sort of function. Um, and it's actually quite comfortable, but extremely heavy. Um, this is made in Portugal with a brand called Uva, um, who works with sort of small, traditional Portuguese um, craftspeople. Um, Playhouse is a project that was commissioned by the um, Exhibit Columbus, which is an architectural biennial in Columbus, Indiana. and um, 
when they asked us to create a project, they um, one of their goals for the project was, um, and really I think for the biennial at large, was to reinterest the town citizens in its architecture. So if you haven't been to Columbus, you should go. Um, it's pretty incredible. Um, they're sitting on this kind of uh, almost architectural museum within the uh, town. And um, so we wanted to create something that would not only uh, speak to that, but also um, encourage uh, children that lived in Columbus to have some sort of meaningful, memorable interaction with this architectural environment. So um, the site for this project, it's on the main street of town and it's all like two, three story um, sort of brick uh, uh, commercial except for this one alley and so we put the playhouse right here in this little alley um, the children's museum is here there's like a hundred year old ice cream parlor right here so this is like a very sort of central kid zone and um, the premise for this project is um, it's a space that looks longer than it is um, it uses forced perspective to create this illusory depth um, but it's a space that can be inhabited by both adults and children um, but in different ways. Um, because the space gets so much smaller as you move to the back of it, you're sort of forced or encouraged to rethink your uh, sort of relationship to the space. Um, while kids have a very different sort of reverse experience, going from a space that feels tall to a space that feels sort of proportionally sized. So that's what it looks like at the back. Um, and the project I want to close on is a project from um, this past summer in Washington, D.C., which was called Fun House. And um, we returned to the National Building Museum. We were there in 2015 uh, to do the beach. And uh, last year, they asked us uh, to come back. And so uh, coincidentally, we were planning um, this exhibition project, which we were working on, um, had this working title of Fun House. Um, and so we proposed this project to them, which was really um, an exhibition of Snow Architecture's work. Um, it's collecting uh, a sort of a selected version of 10 years worth of work into a single um, environment. And so as soon as we started talking about the exhibition, the idea of an exhibition, we knew we didn't want uh, models and drawings and photographs, um, that we knew we wanted an exhibition that would reflect the actual aims of the projects, which is, again, to encourage interaction, to create this engagement, um, to invite people to physically um, enter, inhabit, experience these spaces. Um, so we recreated a lot of the work um, in order to do that. And the premise for this project is this house. So the idea of the house that um, could be moved around, it would have the work in it, um, and that each room in the house would be um, a different project, a different um, uh, group of work. And uh, because we've never designed a house, we felt like um, why not create a house that we could invite people into? It'd be an architecture's house. Um, so this is how the project worked. There was a, sort of a front yard area where we created this large um, seating installation that kind of references the very first project we looked at in Memorial Bowing. Um, the house was sort of in the middle here. And then this backyard that uh, would have, that's a playhouse there, there's a seating installation here. Um, and then this pool um, is the beach. So rather than redo the beach, uh, we turned it into a pool in the backyard of the house. Um, and this is the house getting built. Um, and so this is what it ended up looking like. So there's a few things at play here. Um, one is, um, what looks like a white painted house from the front um, is actually not made uh, from a material that you would make a house from. It's made from an architectural EPS installation um, that's been broken away and it reveals the sort of different layers, the different um, structural layers of the house as you move back through it. Um, this is the backyard with the pool. And then this is the kind of entrance. So you're looking into the house through a project that we did called DIG, which was um, a project at Storefront for Art and Architecture in 2010 that explored the architecture of excavation. And so that was really like the entryway to the house. You went through a hallway, there's broken mirror, here's the uh, kiss shoes on the ceiling. Um, this is a different version of the marble run that, um, based on a project we had done in 2014. Um, this is the bathroom of the house, which uses the beach chair here, which is basically a chaise long made from materials from the beach um, as the bathtub and uh, brings in different pieces that kind of reference the different functions or programs of a room. Um, this was a room that was uh, a recreation of a project that we did in Milan in 2015 uh, called Light Cavern. That's a room full of these uh, fabric ribbons. Um, Back here you see overhead is a project called Drift that we did at Design Miami in 2012. Um, a seating installation called Pillow Fort um, from 2017. There's Playhouse. And um, here's the letters in the front which spell Funhouse from above. And there we are. 
Um, so that's it. I'll leave it to um, questions and maybe invite Daniel back up. Um, so yeah, we can end questions, conversation, whatever you guys want. Any questions? There's got to be some students in here. There's no student questions. <laughs> okay. What is the use of streetwear have you guys um, for your work? It was, uh, it was streetwear team. That's the first place I found both of you guys. Um, so I'm wondering where those kind of paths cross. I mean, Ronnie was a friend of mine. Ronnie Ronnie Feig, um, the founder of Kith, and when he was beginning to think about expanding uh, Kith. Um, we started talking about ways that we could integrate some of the experiences that he had had at a architecture project into the, the kind of experience that people, he wanted people to have in his shops. Um, and I think he was very brave to do that because he was trying to engage people. Um, I mean, the new store in, in New York has a gallery within it as well, but engage people um, who might not otherwise go to a gallery, go to a museum, you know, people just shopping for sneakers, uh, in something that was more experiential. And following that, the kind of streetwear universe found us, I guess. Is, yeah, sure. Can you talk about the experience of making art for yourself versus making design slash art for clients? Do you have different expectations? I mean, I think the way that we've defined it within the studio is you wouldn't necessarily that art, say that art doesn't have a function, but you could say that its function wasn't specific. And oftentimes, the work that architecture does has a specific function. Um, in some cases, the client has a particular thing that they're trying to achieve with it as well. I mean, you can you can probably speak to that. Yeah, I'm not sure how you feel about making art and whether that's something that's for yourself. But um, yeah, we have an interesting relationship within Snark Architecture to the idea of a design brief. Or it's not something that we are often responding to. Um, certainly, there are projects that come that um, have specific requirements or specific requests. Um, but uh, it's more often than not something that we f I think we feel is very um, self-driven. It's something that, in some ways, we are making for ourselves. Um, but that said, we're also making it for everybody. Um, it's not necessarily intended for one person is uh, probably the way that it's most often being approached. It's something that's intended for all people. And I think we're creating spaces, experiences that um, if we feel compelled to want to be in them, that we um, have reached a level where we trust that other people will want that as well. Um, what's inspiring me to move forward into the next decade? I mean, I think, you know, as the as both practices grow, we're uh, we're presented with new spaces to show, um, new new materials um, that we're able to work with, um, and I I think there's there's a kind of confluence, you know, in in reference to his idea about streetwear. One of the things that I found particularly amazing about engaging that audience is, it's a much wider group of people um, than might otherwise go to museums or galleries. And I often find that people who are attending exhibitions or visiting snark architecture projects, it may be the first kind of gallery or museum experience that a lot of them have had. Uh, and that's certainly something great for us to be able to engage with. Yeah, I would add that I think the practices, um, we're still early um, in that there's a lot of areas that we haven't explored, whether that's <coughs> different typologies of projects or different scales of work. Um, so it's something that we're uh, still hungry for in the studio to reach um, what, whatever those goals might be. So the question was about Adidas and um, the, this 4D technology. I mean, the reason why I was able to do that, 
project with Adidas was because of Ronnie, because Ronnie told them that they should do it, essentially. <laughs> um, so I was the only, and still the only visual artist that ever had a, a sneaker contract with Adidas. And when I went into their studio the first time, there was all of these amazing materials that they had and technologies. And every time I tried to do something, they would say like, oh yeah, but we haven't tested that or we can't use that because of whatever reason. Um, but 4D is something that they, um, they were very much behind. And I think in the long uh, game of that, their biggest intention is to be able to um, reduce uh, material use. So um, sneakers, the, the materials of them are very difficult to recycle because they're multiple uh, materials. And they're trying to reach an end game where they can create product that has function, that has zero, zero waste. And this is a, um, something interesting for us as well. The, the selection of the objects, you mean? Right. Like, did, were you actually in, in the photography? Like, did you have a friend who did it? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I mean, before I, the, photography was the first thing that I actually studied. I've never shown my, um, my photography publicly in that way, but that was kind of my entrance to, uh, to art, thinking about art. And I think the first thing that I made that I thought about as a kind of creative outlet was in photography. Um, but in terms of the selection of, of objects for the works that I've cast and even the integration of some of the um, footwear or you know, fashion designs within it, I'm always looking for things that I know have a wide um, accessibility. Like pe you know what it is. Right. And it doesn't matter whether it's here or, or as I said, like in Japan or anywhere, um, there's a kind of cultural touch point to it that it, um, is fluid. Um, Anthony and JJ invited us here um, a couple years ago. Um, Alex came for the first time and looked around, and I remember he came back and he was kind of like, Some, there's something like happening over there that we should pay attention to. <laughs> um, and we came back a, a couple times, initially um, about the beach and thinking about locations where we could um, create that installation. Um, and you, you guys should all definitely try to get over there, but it's in a very um, kind of central location. The architecture of the space lends itself quite well to, to what we're doing there, and um, hopefully it's not the last time that we come back here. Yeah, I would add, I think the first, I'd been to Detroit a few times before, but I think that the first time we came here officially for some architecture was actually at the invitation of Cranbrook. So um, it was first Scott's, I don't know if Scott's here, but um, yeah, first Scott's uh, 3D class uh, a few years ago. I mean, I think there's, um, as Alex said, like when we are creating things in the studio, generally if we feel excited about them, <laughs> other, we expect other people to as well. Um, but there's a kind of uh, reduction in palette and simplicity about a lot of things. Um, and a lot of the installations, um, and if you go to the beach, I think you'll notice is they, they sort of change people's behavior, you know, seeing somebody who you might not otherwise expect to enjoy their experience, you know, lying in this pool of balls or struggling to get out of it. Um, there's a there's a kind of um, there's an interesting area in that for us, like pulling people outside of their everyday. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I think that we think a lot. Um, I mean, on a really basic level, creating transformative experiences, experiences that again are outside of the everyday. Um, and one of the ways, um, additionally, that we think about doing that is um, this idea of tactility, the creating spaces that are encouraging you to touch them in a way or to become immersed in them in a way. I think a lot of us um, or much of the world understands architecture as something that's relatively uh, weighty and you're not really meant to touch a lot of the surfaces. Um, 
in the spaces that we exist in. And we're looking to flip that to create these spaces that whether they're soft, whether they're strange, whether they're something different, um, that ask you to reconsider that relationship and um, you know, maybe you are supposed to touch the ceiling or walk through the wall or whatever that might be. Maybe we take one more. We have someone in the back. No, nobody in the, in the back. <laughs> yeah. In the studio. So, in the images that you saw that um, that Alex showed of the studio, we've intentionally um, set it up so I have my arts production and my art studio on one side of the studio, and snark architecture on the other. Um, and there's a kind of overflow of materials and ideas, and I think certainly um, for both studios, you know, there's not a lot of architecture studios that have this full kind of production entity within them. Um, so for our team in Star Architecture, they're seeing how a lot of the sculptural work that I'm making is, is produced. And in some cases, those processes or materials are then borrowed and used by the architecture studio and vice versa. Um, precision is not something that I'm very good at. <laughs> and, and borrowing some of that from the architecture studio and um, allowing things to proceed in a way where we can create an exhibition on the other side of the planet that is communicated in architectural language that's consistent um, is also you know, a benefit. Um, maybe I can just talk for a second about an architecture's process and how we work in the studio, which is um, to say very collaboratively, this team is 11 right now. Um, and almost everyone in the studio has an architectural background, but not everybody. Um, and when we start a project, we're generally sitting around a table uh, talking, we're having a discussion, and really everything starts at that kind of conceptual uh, level that's emerging just from this dialogue. And uh, from there, we're drawing, we're sketching, we're sort of um, starting really wide, casting a wide net and then filtering. Um, and trying to be, really for us, a lot of that's about efficiency. Um, we're not iterating 50 different options and full 3D renders. We're um, throwing out a lot of the bad ideas, trying to throw them out as soon as we can, um, and really hone in on what we're, uh, what we're after. Um, and yeah, it's a great team in the studio. We really, um, you know, Daniel and I founded the practice, Ben's the third partner. Obviously we sort of steer the direction, but um, it's really the staff that's uh, putting in a lot of the effort in terms of um, developing and um, making those projects happen. Um, so we're gonna hang around. Um, 